if there <clears throat> is any one thing that I hope we learn from the modern political environment, from the current political situation. That one thing is that character matters. The character of our leaders matters. This simple point is not clearly understood by most people in the modern world. Character matters. The character of leaders matters. We get caught up <clears throat> in arguments over this and that policy. But in the end, character determines the future of this world. And it's essential for us to, on the one hand, value character, virtue, ethics in the leaders of this period and also to create structures in which we train people, we train our future leaders in virtue, ethics, character. That is exactly what this place does. Too often, we ourselves are a certain way, but act another way. We don't deal with the underlying selfish, hateful, ignorant patterns that cause us to want to behave in certain ways. We continue to want to behave in those ways, but make ourselves act in other ways. We shame ourselves into it or we're afraid of what other people will think of us if we are who we really are. To do this, to respond in this way, is to make the statement that character does not matter. Who we really are doesn't matter. Who we act like is what matters. The presentation we give is what matters. Have we presented ourselves in a smooth and polished, eloquent way so that people will think we're wonderful? That's the question we ask. Have we presented ourselves appropriately? Now, of course, it's important for us to present ourselves appropriately. There's nothing wrong with making use of the typical assumptions about how we should appear. There's nothing wrong with that in itself. In fact, that's a skill that is important to learn. However, if we use that to avoid the development, the purification of our character, and we've taken something useful and made it into something worse than useless. Because we ourselves think that we can avoid character development, because we ourselves respond to our own internal, negative, problematic, ignorant patterns by covering them over with an act, because of that, we look at leadership and think it's appropriate for them to do the same. And because of that, the world is endangered. It's essential for us to have a place where people can come 
and receive the guidance needed in order to cultivate and purify character. In this way, we come to embody the solution to the world's problems, not just speak about it in a beautiful way, but embody it in a way which is, let's face it, often not so beautiful. Or if you want to think it is beautiful, then that's fine, but it's an awkward kind of beauty, which is just what one of our supporters calls this community. He says, what is it that this community manifests? Awkward beauty. Another one of our main supporters <clears throat> has come here. He's visited many different communities. He's done retreats here and there. He's lived in other monasteries for periods of time. And he, coming here, when he left, he said, you know what I can say about this place? This is real. And you should make that your motto. And that should be your, your line. This is real. Because what you're doing is real. And real isn't always pretty. Not always pleasant. It's not always easy. But for people who want to become enlightened leaders, people who can actually embody and demonstrate the solution to the problems, for such people, we create this place. People who understand that character matters. And so such people come here. And what happens next? Well, all of you know, it's not pretty. Is not necessarily fun. Why? Because in this particular way, you are held accountable. Again and again, your character is questioned. Now, let's face it. For most people, having our character questioned, especially if it turns out that the person who's questioning it is right, is right that we've made a mistake, that we've seen things incorrectly. This is actually unbearable and will villainize that person, attack them. Let's face it, that's the norm. It's very difficult for us to be in a situation in which our judgment, our views are constantly called into question and are often proven wrong. And yet, that's exactly the furnace that people who come here are put into. Why? Why is it worth it? Because character matters. Because in this way, there cannot be a compromise. Of all the ways <clears throat> in which we uh, look at character here, The most uh, ubiquitous, the most interminable <laughs> uh, in our experience, the most unavoidable is the search for and rooting out of hypocrisy. If we say it, we must do it. If we haven't done it, then we can't say it. When <clears throat> the residents here give talks, give public talks, a very important practice, very important growth modality to be put on the spot, have people looking at us, seeing us as leaders, ourselves demanding that we rise to that occasion, When people here give talks and write a summary of that talk to be posted, to advertise so that people will come to it. When I read that summary, the first thing I'm looking for is, is this person making claims that they're not in a position to make? 
Are they saying things that they don't know? Are they attempting to provide people with an understanding that they don't have? That's the first thing that I'm looking for. And it's the first thing that I'm looking for when I myself <clears throat> write those and give talks. Am I making claims that I am not in a position to make? It's not just, though, <clears throat> in those public talks right here during our uh, community life. Are we telling people to do things that we ourselves don't do? Are we asking of others what we're not asking of ourselves? Are we saying that we will do things that we don't do? This form of dishonesty is the enabler of, and I know this is an extreme statement, but it is supported by Buddhist scripture and certainly by my own investigation. This form of dishonesty is the enabler <clears throat> of all forms of evil. If we can engage in this kind of dishonesty without shame, without regret, if we can tell deliberate lies in this way, then if the occasion arises, there is no evil we will not do. That's an extreme statement, I know. But again, let's look at the current political situation. This isn't an area that we can treat lightly. Because our lives are literally at stake. The lives of everyone on this planet are literally at stake right now. We can't <clears throat> approach this subject with the ultimate aim of feeling comfortable. And people who come and train here aren't the sort who would do that. Because it's not comfortable to face this, to look at ourselves in this way, to question ourselves in this way. Of course, Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we have to question ourselves. People will always be disagreeing with us. People will always be checking on us. People will always be demanding more of us, <clears throat> of course. And yet, here, we intentionally structure every day all of the forms of communication, the interpersonal relationships, the schedule, <clears throat> around the constant feedback to be checking on each other's character, so that each of us is constantly cultivating what needs to be cultivated and purifying, discarding what's harmful. We're all doing that. And you can remember, if you look back over just today, I can look back on a dozen occasions in which people were put in uncomfortable situations, questioning their integrity, their sincerity, their uh, dedication happens again and again and again. The Buddha said <clears throat> that you come to know a person's character not in a short time, but over a long time. It's a very powerful statement. You don't come to know who a person is just in a single conversation. You come to know who they are by observing their behavior in many different situations and seeing whether their conversation and their decisions are in accord. He said, <clears throat> you don't come to know a person's character through distance, but through intimacy. And again, in this environment, we're very intimate, often much more intimate than we'd like. We live very close together, it's not always easy and we may know a lot more about each other than we would have wanted to when we first arrived. 
And in fact, other people may know more about us than we would have wanted them to when we first arrived. And yet because of that, because of this forced intimacy, there aren't any hiding places. There's no day in which you're off. Even on the free days, you're not really off because on the free days, you can't help but spend time around each other. And it's just a pattern in our culture to be looking at each other, coming to know each other, and being willing to be held to impeccability. This is uh, how character is developed. Because if we live one life during the day and another life at night, then we can offload, we can uh, shift certain parts of ourselves to certain times of day. Or one person now or another person then, and a whole person doesn't develop. And the various aspects of our mistaken views can hide in both environments. And yet, we <clears throat> here commit ourselves to being intimate, to seeing each other, and observing how this person under these circumstances tends to have relatively poor judgment. This person under those circumstances tends to have relatively good judgment. You can sit down. Don't do that. And this is a good example right now. There it is, perfect example of a situation which is difficult to, uh, to see things clearly. And so we question each other, we say, do this, don't do that. And then we're in a position to wonder, why did I do that? How can I adjust that? And again and again, in the most intimate of ways, we're held to account. In this way, it has the intimacy of a, of a family. And yet, it doesn't have the same kind of relationship as a family. It's a professional relationship. Uh, we know what our purpose here is. And it is to make ourselves and each other into the kinds of leaders who can embody the solution to the terrifying problems of the world. This embodiment is something which we hold each other to over a long time so that the patterns are really purified. Again and again, we hear people say, people come here and they say, you know, I did a, a retreat and I thought I dealt with that. But now I'm here and I'm realizing I just, just got to know it. <laughs> Didn't deal with it. It's only over time, hard work, that these patterns are character. These uh, underlying tendencies shift and are corrected again and again. Because of this, it's naturally the case that when people first come, the usual direction that people move in is towards what we might call humility. Now, humility is a very nice feeling word. But sometimes the direct experience of moving towards humility isn't so nice feeling. You go through that bit by bit, and because it has actually been done, not just talked through, not just considered, not just decided upon, but has actually been done, because the, the shifts that are needed have actually been achieved, a new confidence emerges. A confidence that isn't just an attitude. It's not just a way of talking to ourselves so that we feel better about ourselves. A confidence emerges because nothing can take away our own ethical improvements. We have made those shifts. We have actually sacrificed in those ways. We have actually sacrificed in those ways. And that way we gain a new kind of confidence. 
But not only that, not only do we gain a new kind of confidence in ourselves, we gain a new kind of confidence in each other, in the human race. Because too often, nowadays, we want spiritual teachers. And so who do we find as our spiritual teachers nowadays? Well, we find people who we see for a week at a retreat, and we only see them for some of the time, even during that week, when they're at, at their best, on their best behavior, and they have all these wise things to say, and they're always smiling. Or even less intimate than that, we just get a book, and we read the book. We think it actually represents who this person is. In the book, everything they say is so smart. And then you look at their picture, and they're always smiling. They're always happy. 100% of the time, 24 hours a day, they're happy. They never age. They're never wrong. It's wonderful. And we start to believe that that's the reality. I was talking to someone. <coughs> uh, it was just, uh, just her marriage had broken up. She was talking about a couple, this relatively famous couple who teaches spirituality, both uh, purportedly enlightened. She said, oh, it must be so wonderful to be, to be them, you know, they have a wonderful relationship. And I said, you know, as far as you know, they have all the same problems that you've had in your marriage. You don't know. You don't know them at all. You went to one weekend retreat with one of them. <laughs> and yeah, he was smiling the whole time. That's good. You don't know anything about him. And you don't know anything about them. And she said, well, yeah, but they've stayed together. And I said, I, okay, good, they stayed together. But as far as you know, the only reason for that is that if they were to get divorced, it would just wreck their brand. <laughs> it would. You wouldn't go back to, hit, to, to those weekend retreats if they got divorced. <laughs> it would destroy their financial situation. Now, the point isn't that I'm saying that these people are any certain way. I don't know anything about their marriage. The thing I'm saying is, I don't know anything about their marriage, and neither do you. We don't know. The people who we take as our spiritual teachers are distant, uh, not intimate. We don't know them very well. It's completely different from living in a place. For me, the shift was living with a teacher, watching him, living with him, seeing how he actually lives, seeing if his actual choices accord with his teachings. And these choices aren't things that you can judge under scripted and choreographed circumstances. It's what does he do when something unexpected happens, when he didn't have time to plan out the perfect solution. In this way, we come to know <coughs> that people who have moved along this path aren't the, aren't, don't accord with our idea of a perfect person, that they were never supposed to, that it was never about that. It was never about the act, which so many spiritual teachers nowadays have perfected. But we don't know if it's the reality. And the reality is awkward. It may not be pretty. And people make mistakes. People have flaws. People have limited resources. Right within that, do we see something beautiful? Right within that awkwardness, is there a beauty? This is the shift which nowadays we don't value enough. This is the difference which we need to create. We need to create places in which this is taught. People are guided to this, to a real shift, a real improvement in character. Why? Because with that confidence that we gain in ourselves, with that confidence that we gain in each other, as we see the gradual, slow, halting, confused behavioral adjustments, as we observe all of that, we gain a deep confidence that nothing can take away. 
No matter what names people call us, it doesn't really matter compared to the sacrifices we've made already. Yeah, you could make me feel a little bad, but when I made that ethical choice, that felt really bad. That was terrible. I didn't want to do that at all, but I did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. I was tired. I was exhausted. It made me feel like my heart was being torn to shreds, but I did it because it needed to be done. And so whatever you say, it's not as powerful as the decision I already made. To have that level of confidence enables us to burst forth into the path of awakening. If we don't have that level of confidence, we won't let go sufficiently. If we're always protecting ourselves from ourselves, from our, from our reality, from the rotten truth inside of our hearts, if we're always protecting ourselves from that, if we're always protecting others from that, if we're always protecting ourselves from their rotten reality, if all of that's happening, we'll never really let go. It's only once we see that all of that is just because of the choices we make, and we can make different choices. Once we make those different choices, actually make them, not just read about them or think about them or tell other people to make them, but actually make them and see other people making them, then a new confidence emerges that allows us to enter upon a path of true relinquishment. With that true relinquishment comes true compassion. True compassion. Not just the kind of compassion that happens because we tell ourselves we ought to be compassionate but a compassion that bursts forth before we knew whether we should be compassionate. That's already true. And then we move through the, again, very difficult path, long path of bringing our entire life into accord with that. This matters. This matters, that people are willing to make these levels of sacrifices, go, go through this level of humility, confusion, in order to burst forth as compassionate, wise leaders. That there are such people matters. And it's essential for the sake of this beautiful world, that we fully commit ourselves to allowing such leadership, to enabling such leadership, to fostering such leadership, to holding such leadership precious for the sake of all living things. very much appreciate the choices, the sacrifices, the efforts that you make, all of us in this community. This can be trusted. Let us trust it.